Welcome and thank you for joining us for our April 1st Tuesday. My name is Daniel Center and I am the Conservation Project Manager for the MetHow Conservancy. For those of you who don't know, the MetHow Conservancy is a nonprofit land trust and community conservation organization whose mission is to inspire people to care for the land of the Methow Valley. I would just like to start off this evening with a land acknowledgement and an introduction. Now, as a conservation organization, the Methow Conservancy seeks to protect and steward the land that for time immemorial was cared for by members of the Methow tribe. This is their homeland. We recognize that we must do more to build better relationships and acknowledge our past with our Methow tribe descendants who still live and care for the land in this valley. We encourage each of you to learn more about the past, present, and future of the Methow people by visiting the Methow Valley Interpretive Center located on the Twist Works campus or by going online to MethowValleyInterpretiveCenter.com. Like many rural communities in the West, the Methow Valley has had a rich past with ranching and agriculture. When white settlers began to homestead the Methow, they dotted the valley floor with small family farms. Apple trees and livestock once easily outnumbered people. While things look just a little bit different today, agriculture continues to thrive here and we are so fortunate to have a vibrant community of farms producing livestock, dairy, hay, orchard fruits, grains, and a variety of vegetables. Anyone who visits the farmer's market in Twist can attest to the quality of food and community grown on Methow soils. I'm not sure if this valley's strong agricultural scene is one of the reasons that our speaker tonight, Ashley Ahern, came to live in the Methow Valley. But I do know that once she got here, that community has had a big influence on her. Ashley and her horse Pistol can regularly be seen this time of year, helping one of our longtime ranchers move their cattle to spring pastures in the hills. By lending a hoof, Ashley has developed strong friendships within the Methow ranching community and through those relationships has developed a passion for telling the stories of farms and farmers. One of the ways she is sharing that passion is here at the Methow Conservancy as one of our board of directors, where she is helping our organization maintain a strong legacy of supporting farms through the permanent protection of over 4,000 acres of ag land and in supporting farmers with programs such as Methow Grown or the Farms to Neighbors program. I'd like to think that it was on one of these Methow cattle drives that Ashley got the inspiration for her most recent podcast and subject of tonight's talk. The newly released series is called Women's Work, which you can listen to wherever you find your podcasts. And it features women across the West who are adopting more holistic and sustainable ranching practices. While none of these stories come directly from the Methow, the challenges and triumphs shared are as relevant here as anywhere in the West. During this difficult time of rapid rural development, land conversion, and climate change, Ashley is giving an important voice to the people who grow our food. So without further ado, let's welcome Ashley Ahern. Hi everyone, so great to be here this evening with you and thanks for taking time out of a beautiful night to be indoors looking at a computer screen. I'm looking out my window at my horses grazing peacefully as the sun goes down and wishing I was out there feeding them. But I'm also so happy to be here with you all. Um, so tonight I wanna to take you behind the scenes on the production of my latest series, Women's Work. Um, and I can't see all your faces, but I'd love a, just a quick nod or show of hands. How many of you have listened to some of the series or caught here and there. Yeah, I'm seeing some waving. Okay, great. It's just good to know. Um, and I, I guess I want to start, I'm going to take you, we're going to play some, uh, some audio from the series, talk about kind of how I went about um, putting it together, but then starting really with an acknowledgement that it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't live here, if I hadn't moved to this community, as Daniel was alluding to, and started to meet the people who um, grow our food, raise our meat. 
uh, and frankly fall in love with them in a lot of different ways. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation here with a screen share. Okay. How's that looking, Daniel? You good? Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. All right. So let me move this down here and. Okay, so this is the logo for the series, Women's Work. And I, um, so I guess, so I'm not sure how many of you know my backstory, but I've been in the Valley for about four years now, moved here from Seattle, um, longtime NPR environment and science journalist um, who had been covering issues of natural resources, climate change, energy from the concrete jungle. And kind of started to realize that when we look at the effects and the communities who are feeling firsthand the effects of climate change and these changes that we're all seeing. Um, a lot of it is happening more pronouncedly, I think, in rural communities. And that's not news to anyone here in the Metau where we experienced what was the largest wildfire in Washington state history until it was surpassed um, recently by more fires that are getting bigger. So moving out here and uh, becoming more connected to the land and people on the front lines of the stories I'd been covering from the city, I think marked a really important turning point in my career. And it, so when I came here, it was important to me to get to know those people and sort of break out of the shell of, um, I think a lot of the folks who move here and maybe stay within their comfort zones or the people that we, we kind of refer to it as the Carhartt and Lycra or Carhartt and Spandex divide in the Valley. I'm sure many of you have heard this term. Um, and I definitely maybe perhaps came from more of the Lycra side of things, but I own a lot more Carhartt these days. And I try to go back and forth and wear both and try to speak both of those languages. And one of the things that I adore about this community is that I do believe that's still possible and that there are many people who are um, bilingual, if you will, and um, walk in both those worlds. And I think part of what I wanted to do with this series was help to do that at a broader scale. And so a little bit of the disconnect that I was seeing centers around beef. Um, so I'll start by just playing the trailer of the series because I think it's sort of the most authentic way to say a little bit about my journey. Hey, my name is Ashley Ahern. I'm riding my mare, Pistol. Good girl. And uh, she and I are up in the mountains of the little valley I live in, north central Washington, helping a local rancher gather up his cows. And moving toward the exits. Come on, let's go. Let's go, let's go, ladies. And I moved to this valley about three, four years ago now. And when I got here, I was a vegetarian. I had been covering the environment for NPR and member stations for more than a decade. And uh, as we know, cows, if they're not managed well, can be real bad for the environment. They can be left to overgraze the land. They can destroy riparian areas and wetlands. And then you look at, you know, what we feed them and how we process them. And it's, you know, a handful of big corporations that handle the slaughtering and set the prices for beef and concentrate the wealth and don't treat the workers great. That's to say nothing of the greenhouse gas emissions that cows release through their digestive process. So a lot of different reasons that I just decided after looking at the science and looking at the evidence that I didn't want to eat meat anymore. And so I was vegetarian. All right, come on, Mary, keep going. And then I moved to this remote valley and I a woman uh, gave me my horse, Pistol, got her for free, which is sort of like a free puppy, um, not a free beer. <laughs> and I started just volunteering to help herd cows. Let's go. Come on, babies. And uh, ranchers know a bargain, I guess, when they see one, because I'll work for free, as long as I get to ask them a lot of dumb questions. And I got to see firsthand how hard ranchers work on some really tight margins and how closely they're observing their land, they're observing their livestock, and that they're directly invested in both of those things being healthy in order for them to continue making a living. They're running a business that's based on the success of the land and the landscape. Hey, cow! Come on out, ladies! And so that all raised a question for me. Can we raise animals in a way that is less harmful for the environment and allows a way of life to continue? That goes on for a little while longer and you can, that's episode one, if you've already, if you want to go check it out. 
Um, but I share that because that was recorded on horseback. That was not faked or studio produced. Um, and I try to kind of hide it from ranchers that I ride for when I have my iPhone out. I'm sort of talking to myself as I'm riding along, <laughs> allegedly gathering their cows for them. Um, but it's been, it's such a journey for me. And I've learned so much in being so far outside of my comfort zone. Um, Pistol is a very good horse, but she has a problem with crossing water. And so a lot of times I'm trying to hide the fact that my horse is only partially trained and um, chooses to do certain things and not others when a lot of good, good cow horses do exactly what they're told when they're told um, so that the job can get done. So uh, the ranchers I ride for have been very patient with me and Pistol. And here are a few of them. Uh, you can see this is Steve Thompson. He manages um, Moccasin Lake Ranch. It's the upper left. And then upper right is Craig Bozel. And um, everyone knows his name. And uh, I was helping move his cows through Pipestone. I believe that's Betsy Smith in the background. She was riding with him that day. Um, it's not a great picture, but that's BCS, Betsy Smith. Um, and that's Deed Fink in the lower and lower left and right. Um, and he was out late one night, just standing with a, a young first time heifer who had not accepted her calf yet and needed to be reminded to let the baby nurse. So he would go out there every three hours um, just to stand over and make sure the baby got what it needed. So I shared these as kind of a acknowledgement of the hard work that I've gotten to observe up close um, that comes with a deep sense of stewardship and care. And as I said in the trailer, um, if they trash the place, they can't make a living. If they don't take good care of their livestock, they won't be raising the meat, the meat won't survive, right? To be making it to our tables. Um, and so the dedication that I think I've been able to see firsthand is one that um, I never fully understood until I kind of was right there, had a front row seat to it. And I think it makes it a lot harder to just say, you know, cows are bad for the environment. Um, we need to get away from meat as I think is part of the mainstream conversation. Now you see the rise of impossible burger and um, fake meat and more and more people moving toward vegeta vegetarianism. And as a former vegetarian, I will never judge someone for their, their health and eating choices. I will just speak for myself personally in that um, it's a more complicated picture. And it's, uh, as one rancher told me, it's not the cow, it's the how. Um, it's how the animal is raised, how the land is steward and, stewarded and managed um, that I think is worth looking more closely at. And so um, it was the ranchers here and uh, that really kind of inspired me to start asking these questions. And so I started learning about the regenerative ranching movement. And uh, you know, I'll get into a little more about what that exactly means. It is a very broad phrase and it can be abused. It can be, um, you know, some ranches have been accused of greenwashing and using that term to kind of sell their beef for more without actually changing their practices. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge that that is out there, but I also want to, what I wanted to do in the series in women's work was to highlight the ranchers on the forefront of change in the industry um, that are leading the charge, I would say. And so I started just learning everything I could about regenerative ranching and um, the different practices and different kind of new ideas that are being talked about. And it emerged, a story emerged to me. Um, I started joining listservs, going to conferences, um, looking at internship programs for you know new ranchers, new agrarians, this kind of stuff. And um, reading more um, just media about ranching and regenerative ranching. And um, sure enough, women seem to be leading that charge. And I don't say that, you know, this is not an exclusive claim. Um, sorry, my dog is making a lot of noise in the background all of a sudden. Um, this is not a, a claim that is exclusive to women. Of course, all of the women I featured in this series, and the reason I started the first episode with the Lannons, um, Malloy is the 14 year old girl and her parents, Megan and Pete, um, there's a really touching moment where Pete uh, cries a little bit because he's so proud of his daughter. And I, I chose to start with that episode in part because I wanted to make it clear that this is not a series that is about excluding men. It's about celebrating women and it's about passing the microphone. But the truth is that all of these ranches that I visited um, were operated in partnership, in deep partnership, often husband and wife, um, or other, you know, ranch manager and, and owner in Corey Carmen's case, the final episode, um, you know, there's too much work to be done by yourself. And so um, focusing this series on women was a way of sort of, yeah, passing the microphone to the quieter side of the equation. And so it started out as a hunch. I was kind of like, okay, I have, you know, I'm seeing, you know, in all these listservs and conversations that are happening around regenerative ranching, it seems to be kind of being spearheaded by women. So I started kind of 
thinking about this more and trying to, and, and started, you know, right here in the Valley looking, this is Carrie Fink, Deed Fink's wife um, of Fink Cattle Company and, and in the bottom right as well. Um, and so that inspiration started local for me, just look, seeing firsthand at how integral Carrie is to the work of ranching while having a full-time job as a math teacher at our public schools here. Um, and so she's like, I kind of tease her that she's my muse for the series and we're gonna hear from, from her and hopefully Deed a little bit um, towards the end of the presentation. So um, stay tuned for that. So um, part of being here in the Valley was learning a language, as I said, speaking both the, the Lycra and the Carhartt language. And as a journalist, that has um, served me really well, I think, in terms of putting this series together. I'll never forget it when I first, um, so I was visiting with Craig Bozel and, uh, and I just, you know, was stand, stand there as next to his little, you guys know the little Ford Ranger, he drives around the blue one that's probably from like, I don't even know how old it is. I love that, I love that rig. And I was just, you know, had my arm in his window. I was like, so how many cows do you have? And he was like, well, now that's like asking a rancher how many dollars are in his bank account. And I kind of like froze and was like, oh gosh, that's so rude. I can't believe I just did that. And then my mind starts spinning and I'm like, how many ranchers have I interviewed that I've asked that exact question and never known that it was a pretty invasive question to ask. And I share that as just one example of sort of um, my learning that what this valley taught me and how it kind of set me up to be able to even have the currency and the language to start asking these questions and reaching out to these ranches in the hopes that they would invite me out to spend time interviewing them. So um, I'll never forget that uh, there was one, I forget who it was, an old cowboy I was talking to on the phone as I was conducting my research for the series, just starting to gather sort of leads on women I should talk to. and. You know, I asked him, I was like, so do you think I'm, I'm on, am I on to something here? Like, is this whole thing, like women, are they kind of leading the charge? And he just kind of stopped and he's like, well, any rancher will tell you, if you want to get anything done, you talk to the women. <laughs> and that was kind of my like North star, I think in this series, in terms of the roles that women play in ranching communities, um, they are the connectors, they are the conveners. They are the ones that are, um, you know, when someone's sick, they're, they're, you know, bringing food over, they're in the, on the PTA, they're, you know, organizing the events, they're, they're just that connective tissue in a community that often goes perhaps underappreciated or acknowledged, um, but is sort of the beating heart of that, of many of these communities. And that's certainly what I've seen here. And I think that um, I get into that a little bit with Rachel Bobian in episode three, where she was, that's the one that talks about the Malheur occupation and, and how she brought her community together after the occupation. And just her quiet way of sort of um, creating space for people to gather and helping facilitate that in a way that made some of the conversations and healing that needed to happen in that community possible. And she's very humble and mortified when I asked her about this and would be mortified that I'm singing her praises even now, but um, I think it's worth singing. All right, so regenerative ag. This is Malloy Lynn and she's the star of our first episode, um, Waiting for Bebet, which was uh, where I camped out at her, her family's ranch outside of Bozeman in the Paradise Valley for, I think it was four or five days waiting for this damn you to give birth. And I had this whole like narrative arc in my mind of how this episode was gonna come together. And it's like, oh, you know, it starts, you know, you meet the family and you wait for the, the land, the, the you to finally give birth at the end. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and I just hung out and I hung out, hung out. And Babette was just not, not having it. So, uh, I took the opportunity to learn about regenerative ranching from the Lannans because they are some of the pioneers, I think, that are really actively embracing um, the practice of adaptive rotational grazing. So, but Malloy is 14, and so she's starting her sheep flock, and I have an update. So last year, Babette, that's the first baby of her flock, and this year she has 10 ewes that are going to be giving birth probably any minute right now. So I'm just very proud of Malloy and how she's building her flock. And rotationally grazing them around her family's ranch so that the area, the grass does not get overgrazed in any one place and it promotes soil health um, by fertilizing it and then moving the animals on, which is kind of the core of rotational grazing and that whole concept. So a couple bullet points, because again, regenerative ranching, first of all, I am not an expert. I've done a lot of research on it and I've interviewed a lot of people on the ground about the practices that they're adopting, but here are some of the kind of key themes that I would point to when I, when I describe something as regenerative. Um, and maybe you have some that you would add. Um, I know Johnny, Johnny Duguay, I hope you're on this call and you wanna pipe up at some point, feel free, maybe towards the end. Um, but yeah, so 
the way I constructed the series was I picked kind of a backdrop issue, i.e. apex predators, wolves in Idaho, for example, that's the Alder Spring Ranch episode. I think that's episode five. And then I looked for a woman rancher who was sort of the foreground character that could bring that issue to life and educate the listener about that practice through her personal passion and what she's doing on her land. So apex predators, basically in regenerative ranching, you see more and more ranchers trying to find alternative methods to have their cows, you know, coexist with creatures like wolves or grizzlies in Montana. And what that looked like for the um, Alder Spring Gals, the ranch in Idaho that I featured, is range riding, basically bringing back an age old practice that cowboys were doing in the 1800s of riding day in and day out with your livestock and keeping them kind of closer together as opposed to spread out over vast pastures um, in order to keep them safe from predators. And it's working. The cool thing about seeing this on the ground, I was in the, you know, riding with them for several days in the Idaho backcountry. And um, I have a picture of that later, holding a microphone and, and riding a horse um, through the underbrush is not for the faint of heart, but they're very patient with me. Um, but what that allowed me to do was to see some of um, the benefits of this practice. And it wasn't just about keeping their cows safe from wolves. It was also about, again, that adaptive rotational grazing approach. When you keep animals together and move them constantly, you prevent them from trashing any one part of the landscape. And so there was this one moment in the pod, and I used it in the episode to kind of illustrate this, where a bunch of cows, cows want to hang out in wetlands. They love being, you know, especially in the heat of the summer, they want to hang out in riparian areas and they trash them if they're left to do that. I will, you know, you can, it's not hard to find examples of that. I'm sure that you've all seen it when you're hiking and it's, it's hard to keep cows from doing that. It's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of um, just time on the landscape that a lot of ranchers don't have, um, frankly, to be able to manage them that way. But, you know, riding around with the, uh, the Elzinga sisters for a few days allowed me to see firsthand um, the benefits of that. And what you see is when cows aren't allowed to graze along the creeks, you see less erosion along the creek beds and you see willows and aspen and all these kind of wet loving, you know, wetland loving trees come back. And with them come all of the amazing animals that we get excited about, you know, the beavers, the grouse, especially in the hot times of year, I saw sage grouse, um, which was of course near and dear to my heart from horseback as we were crossing one of these creeks on their property. Um, so, and then, you know, Glenn Elzinga, the, the patriarch of that family is um, a, a strong proponent of, of rotational grazing because of what it can do for soil health, i.e. when cows are there fertilizing, grazing, you know, cutting down, um, evenly eating across the landscape and then moving on, they basically act like um, rototillers and fertilizers combined in one. They aerate the soil, fertilize it, and then leave. But the key is the leaving and the rest. <clears throat> so being able to see that firsthand was my hope, was a big learning for me, and my hope was to share that learning with listeners through their story. So I have some other things on here, land use and preserving open space and habitat. So this is episode seven, um, where I went to the Colorado Front Range, and my husband's actually from Boulder, so I spent some time there over the years, and you know, you drive down the Front Range of Colorado, and it's, for folks who know that area, it's, it's unrecognizable to many people who go back who haven't been there in a while. The development has just sprung up in, in sprawl all along the freeway in the front of the Rockies. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. And a lot of the developments are named after the ranches that used to be there or the animals that used to live there. Um, but now they're chopped up into McMansions and cul-de-sacs. And um, a big part of seeing that firsthand and featuring a rancher who's working with the Audubon Society to kind of keep her ranch as open space and as bird-friendly habitat as part of their conservation ranching program was really eye-opening to me. And <clears throat> I have to say that, you know, one of the big reasons I joined the board of the Conservancy when I was invited was a deep um, commitment to agricultural land as open space. Um, when we talk about development pressures in this valley, um, you know, I know I'm not the only one who's noticed that, you know, these are pastures that are being chopped up to provide housing, um, to build homes. And we lose something, um, not just for cows, we lose, habitat for wildlife. When, when cows are managed well, they are preserving habitat. Um, and certainly that was the case with the ranch I featured in uh, Colorado. And then finally, I'll just talk quickly about food sovereignty. This was a, a, a new concept for me. Um, sorry, hang on just a sec. Hey, Michael, can you make sure your dog isn't there? Um, sorry, <laughs> there are uh, deer walking by the window and my dog's about to go ballistic. Um, so a new concept for me was um, food sovereignty. And I spent time on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation with a woman named Kelsey Scott, formerly Kelsey Ducheneau. And she's a rancher there, grass-fed beef. 
and she sells uh, primarily to her fellow tribal members of the Cheyenne River Sioux. And she explained to me that um, for her sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, independence comes from food sovereignty. And, um, you know, the term food desert is one that is not um, a good one to use anymore to describe an absence of fresh produce and the availability of fresh food. But um, that is certainly the case on many reservations uh, across the West. And um, Kelsey is using her cows to combat that issue that she sees facing her people. And so um, doing a whole episode featuring her um, was really important to me among all the other ranches that were featured. So I would count food sovereignty, again, under regenerative ranching, because I think it can look a lot of different ways and mean a lot of different things for people. So this is Melanie Elzinga up in the high country, uh, back country of Idaho. And so you can see how closely those cows are together. And for those, forgive me for folks here who know, you know a lot about ranching and how it's done. I'm still learning every day and I have some really good teachers, but um, I will share just looking at this picture, most cow, you know, most ranchers, the practice is you let your cows out in the spring on your grazing allotments, on your pasture land, whether that's forest service or BLM or um, state fish and game, and your cows are out and you check on them, you know, you're making sure they have water and that they're doing okay, but you're not necessarily keeping them close together, right? You're not moving them, you know, quickly day to day or, you know, um, just that presence, that touch is much lighter than what the Elzingas are doing. And it's no accident they have seven daughters free help <laughs> to do this kind of work. So I wanna acknowledge that this is not something that's feasible for every ranch, but it is something that's pretty cool to see in action, especially with the results that they're having. I'll play some audio from them in a sec. This is Kelsey Ducheneau Scott, um, kind of very calmly and gently loading um, a, a steer onto um, the trailer to go to the butcher. And um, you know, I think that if there's one thing I'll say about all of these ranches and this kind of practice is, um, when cows don't spend their lives in feedlots, they spend their whole lives um, kind of doing cow things and they have pretty great lives. And as I say, they have one really bad day, but the rest of them are all pretty damn good. And I see that firsthand from horseback. Um, whereas more than 90% um, of the beef that we eat in this country is cows that have spent a good portion of their life in a feedlot that doesn't get to climb, that don't get to wander around the hills like the Elzinga cows do or like the Fink cows do or Craig Bozel's cows. Um, they spend their, their lives in feedlots and they're fed corn that's grown elsewhere, or soy that's grown elsewhere, grains that are grown elsewhere, and then shipped. And so there's a lot of problems with that um, supply chain, as, as you would imagine. <clears throat> this is um, Rachel Bobian. She ranches outside Burns, Oregon, which, as you know, is in the throes of a really bad drought the past few years. Um, these culverts, this was last spring, um, were supposed to be gushing with water because she flood irrigates her field. And flood irrigation, just quickly, is something that we've gotten away from here in the Metau Valley and across much of the West because it's an inefficient use of water, right? It basically entails just flooding a field um, so that your crops grow and, you know, directly out of a nearby river. So it's surface water. Um, and most of us, most ranches are shifting to um, pivots and sprinklers that are much more efficient. And what we lose though, and this was kind of surprising to me, and I had to check with the Audubon Society to make sure this was accurate, is habitat. Again, ranchers providing habitat is a theme that kind of emerged throughout the series. When Rachel floods her fields, um, Harney County, as, as some of you avid birders I'm sure here know, is, is the home of one of the most amazing migratory bird festivals in the West. And people come from all over the country, all over the world to see the kind of birds that land in these lush fields, these wet fields, low-lying fields in the Harney Basin on their way from South America to the tundra. Um, snow geese, Rawson's geese, I mean, sandhill cranes, the kinds of birds that were just hanging out in these, frankly, cow fields with cows, um, barbed wire surrounding them and flooded um, for the, with irrigation water um, is providing some of the last habitat as Malheur Lake becomes drier and drier. And so it was one of those interesting trade-offs where I think before I would have been quick to say, well, that's an inefficient use of water and the West is dry and we need to be more careful. In a climate changed world, I think the conversation shifts a little bit and we have to start asking some questions about the value of habitat and our role as humans in managing and providing that habitat going forward. So Rachel, I, I chose as an example of that. Okay, a little bit about how I made this thing. Um, this is me recording um, some very, very happy piggies in a pasture at um, Adrian LaRue Corner Post Meets. Um, she's the rancher that is working with the Audubon Society on bird-friendly habitat. 
this is really cool just to see firsthand pasture raised pigs. You know, most of us like, I don't really eat pork actually hardly ever um, in part because pigs are so damn smart that it like hurts my heart a little bit, but also because, um, you know, pigs are raised in some of the worst conditions um, in terms of the lagoons of waste that they create so from an environmental standpoint, but also from an animal welfare standpoint. Um, so I just kind of never ate pork and then coming out here and seeing you know, how these animals spend their lives. Again, she rotationally grazes them. So they are not allowed to hang out in any one part of the ranch for too long. Um, but they similarly with their, what she's found is um, you can see that burned tree in the foreground and some burned evidence of a fire that had passed through there, I think several years before. And she was explaining to me that pig snouts are actually really perfectly suited for rooting through the hardened crust that forms after a fire, you know, the mineralized scorched earth soil and churning those nutrients and those minerals back into the soil. And again, the key is you don't leave them there for too long, but she thinks of her pigs as sort of ninja rotor rototillers that she moves around the ranch to help the land recover from the fire. All right, so this is my, this is my setup. Um, my approach to having made a lot of news stories over the years, my approach to radio reporting now is a little more immersive and a little more, I would say, documentarian style than hard and fast news. So I was basically, that's a mattress. You can see my saddle, my hat, my computer, my microphone. Usually there's a beer on the tailgate at the end of a day um, of recording, but that's a mattress under there. So I would sleep in the bed of my truck and it saved a bunch of money on production. But it also allowed me to um, really be there from sunup to sundown, visiting with ranchers in their natural habitat. And that meant recording the birds at sunrise. That meant showing up in the kitchen when they're having coffee at 6 a.m. or earlier to get out and get their, their work done for the day. Um, and just being able to be a fly on the wall. And um, a couple, yeah, this, so this is Melanie Elzinga and me trying to record on Chang, that giant bay. He was probably like twice the size of a pistol and very bullheaded and had a lot of ideas about what he wanted to be doing at any given moment, which mostly entailed eating while I was trying to, so I'm like yanking on his reins there, just trying to get him to keep his head up while I'm trying to record. Um, but something about interviewing ranchers, doing what they love, and you can see the kind of faraway look in Melanie's eyes as she's describing her connection to that landscape and her family having spent you know, her, her girlhood. With, and she knows all of those draws and creeks and drainages on that land, like the back of her hand, like an old friend, she said. And I think calling somebody up and you're not gonna get that kind of a conversation on tape you're, or on the phone, you're gonna get it when you're in that place with that person. Um, and it was actually here in the Valley that I learned the art of visiting. I just wanna speak briefly about that and then I'm gonna start getting ready to wrap it up here. Um, Visiting, okay, so city people, and I'm generalizing here, but city people catch up, right? Like you get together every couple of weeks and you have dinner and you talk about your kids or school or work or whatnot, and usually or business, you know, you're getting together for a business reason to talk about an idea or something else. And that's kind of how I would approach my interviewing. I think when I was working for KOW and NPR in Seattle was, you know, there was, a, there was a reason that we were sitting down to talk about an issue and you were here to answer my questions. And there was like a narrative arc and a structure that was built in and a goal to the conversation, right? And then I started to understand the term to visit. Visiting is, as many of you know who live rural, is sort of a time spent on the tailgate of a pickup truck after a long day of work, maybe with a beer, maybe not, in conversation that doesn't necessarily have a beginning, a middle, or an end. It doesn't necessarily have a goal. It's about, instead of extraction, it's about sharing of knowledge or just stories. And the stories kind of unfold spontaneously, whether it's you know the horse that bucked you off the day before, or an old timer story from you know, the 1930s about how things used to be done. And I have to say that it's that visiting and the spirit of visiting that um, I learned here in the Valley through the ranchers that I've made friends with, but it's informed how I conduct interviews now. Uh, it's changed the way I conduct interviews, that it's not about extraction or a transaction, it's about a visit and it's about putting someone at ease and learning their world and just kind of sitting with them. And right, and here's, I'm just gonna play a couple cuts and then, and then I'm gonna, um, Deed and Carrie, or Carrie has joined us this evening. So I'm gonna um, put her on the spot and, um, and close it out, but here we go. So this is uh, the art again of the way I do things is, you know, I was camping in the back country, um, you know, no batteries or paved roads for miles <laughs> if anything went wrong, but I was still recording nonstop and then the magic happens. He'd heard something. Hey guys, hey you guys, hey, guys. Huh? come out here a second. This is camp at night. Wait, really? Yeah. Just listen.
his eldest daughter, Melanie, stands next to him. Sure. Yeah. Oh. And so. Yeah. I sure hope we're not missing any cattle. <laughs> no, I think we're good. Cool. What's going through your mind right now, Melanie, as you hear that? Oh, I mean, it's a little bit exciting, but it's also a little uncomfortable. I mean, I, I want to make sure these cattle are safe. And so definitely unsettling. <laughs> so just constantly rolling tape. And then as we say in the business, the radio goddesses shined down upon me and gifted me with that moment. I hadn't seen wolves in years and um, they were up on the ridge feeding on an elk carcass. And my dog is now looking out the window, looking for wolves because he heard them too. So I apologize to others on the Zoom right now whose dogs are losing their minds. All right. And then I just, um, this, uh, this is the cut from sometimes the art, you know, I'm a fly on the wall and I'm there, you know, documentary style for several days, but as with Babette, that didn't work out. She wasn't going to give birth while I was there. Uh, and so what I did, which is sneaky, and I don't say this in, in the podcast, but I taught Malloy and her mom how to use the voice memo app on their iPhones. And then I left because I had to get to Burns to record the migratory birds um, that were arriving. And so I had kind of a hard stop but um, I actually think that the end of this episode is way better because I wasn't there. So I'm gonna share it. Oh shoot, it's not playing. Oh man. All right, well, I'm gonna move on because I think I'm running short on time and I wanna make sure you all have time to ask questions and for Dean Carey to say a few words. So here, I'm gonna end with Corey Carmen. All right, so this is Corey. And the reason I ended up, so Corey runs Carmen Beef. She's in Wallowa Valley, the Wallowa Valley of Oregon, uh, Northeastern Oregon. And um, that's a wildfire burning where her cows are. So she was basically putting that horse in a trailer. I showed up to interview her as she was loading horses into a trailer, literally to drive 40 miles up a dirt road, single road access to where the cows were to get them out of, an on, out of the way of an oncoming wildfire. And this, Corey told me, is what ranching and climate change looks like. And we're seeing it here in the valley. I was helping the Finks move their cows because the fire had burned part of their grazing area and other, other pastures don't have water reliably that used to. So all of this stuff is real. And I was seeing it in every single ranch that I visited, the changes that they're experiencing on the land. And what Corey's doing is she's trying to propose an alternative to our industrial meat system in this country. 85% of the meat, um, meat packing industry is controlled by four companies in the US. And that is a real problem when we look at monopolization, how much ranchers make for their meat, um, and then worker conditions. As I said in the opening to this, this whole talk and the whole series, um, it's why a lot of us probably are moving away from industrial beef, I think, because we don't like the model that is providing it to us, that is, that is making the McDonald's dollar menu possible, frankly. Um, and so what Corey's doing is she now buys from seven ranches around the Northwest who agree to a set of practices that involve minimal use of chemicals, herbicides, um, rotational adaptive grazing, all these kind of practices that I've been talking about. She's, she's asking ranchers if they're going to be selling her beef through her, her alternative pipeline, which is now appearing in new seasons markets and restaurants from Sacramento to Seattle. Carmen beef is being sold. Um, and it's, you know, you have to agree to a certain set of practices and management practices and, uh, and lo and behold, she's kind of changing the meat system. But what I love about Corey and I hope her audio plays, yes, is that she's, she's when the closer. Corey thinks about our future and her future as a rancher racked by wildfire, drought, chemical ridden soil, pandemics that shut down large meat processing facilities, her thoughts turn to her grandmother, Ruth, and the food system of that older generation. It was local and regional. The meat Ruth ate was raised nearby. It was slaughtered nearby. It ate grass because growing a crop like grain and then shipping it all over the country to feed livestock was a bad use of money and land. It was so different from the system we have now. If you were to describe to my grandma when she was, you know, had her first child, um, which would have been in 1940 something, to describe to her the feedlot system for beef or the industrial food system, she would be like, you are nuts. That doesn't even make sense. And yet in 70 years, we created it and we can't imagine anything else. Our limitation is not that we can't feed the world. It's that we can't imagine what it's going to take, but we can totally do it. And we don't have a choice.
I wanted to close with that piece of tape because um, I think that that's why I'm here in this valley now. I think it's because we can do that here. We can localize our food production. It's already happening. And I think that what inspires me about the Conservancy is that um, I want us to serve as a connection between the producers that, that raise our food, that ra are raising beef in this valley and other, you know, other produce, of course, um, and livestock, and the folks who want to support them, who want to see, who want to vote with their dollars for the kind of land use that they want to see in the world um, that presents an alternative. And so I know I'm not the only one who kind of feels like we live in this special place um, and cherishes it and wants to um, support a way of life that I think belongs here too, right alongside the second homes and the retirement homes and, and all of the changes that are happening here. There is... Um, a lifeblood and, a, and a, a way of life that has been here for a long time. And we have a role to play in keeping it around um, and helping it be better, helping it be more sustainable. So that's kind of, I think what drives me. Um, and I hope that in, uh, in hearing this talk this evening, um, the wheels are turning for a lot of you and you're thinking about where you buy your food and how you get it and probably already making some awesome choices and buying local. So I don't need to even say it, but what I did want to do now is, um, Turn it over. So be thinking of your questions, but um, Carrie, I'm going to put you on the spot as my muse for the series <laughs> and ask you, um, Daniel, if you could pass the, um, I don't know, put, put Carrie on the screen. And um, Carrie, I'd love it if you could just talk a little bit about um, maybe a day, a day in your life and uh, a um, kind of some of the challenges that, that ranchers face here in the Valley. And then maybe some ideas about how we can better connect the ranching community, you know, the Carhartts with the Lycra and the, um, you know, the eaters with the producers. So I'll leave it there and, and can't wait to hear your thoughts. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, a I day in the life. Okay, uh, get up, go to school, teach for eight hours and then come home and ranch. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how, that's kind of how it goes. We, we've done this for, you know, I don't know, 30 years. And uh, Deed's family has been here since the late 1800s. And um, it's, it takes, you know, a day job and it takes also then, you know, working nights and afternoons and weekends um, and being able to, you know, pr pr try to provide for, pr for people. Um, spring break this week looks for me like uh, harrowing fields and fixing fence and and um, that kind of stuff. And we, we really, um, we love what we do. We have um, a conservation easement through the Conservancy. Um, uh, probably, I don't know, I don't know how, how many years, 10 or 15 years ago, 15. 15. Um, because we really, we do believe in the land and believe that, you know, when we're gone, that's important to leave um, to whoever's here to do that. And that, you know, the agriculture is important. So, um, what do you want to say? You're doing fine, thanks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I love that man. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we we do have a deep connection with the land. Um, it really is about, you know, like you said, Ashley, taking care of the land and really just knowing and um, I was out harrowing um, yesterday and today and just, just that, you know, you're going around the field, but it's just like the connection to the land and feeling, you know, having that deep connection over and over again, year after year, season after season. And, um, you know, we just really believe in that. And um, I, I, I don't know, I don't know what else to say really. <laughs> Carrie, can you talk a little bit about how um, you're doing more grass fed beef this year, right? Like you're shifting your, your operation a little bit. Yeah, a little. We've seen we've really seen a, a big dem more demand for people want more locally, you know, grass fed beef. And uh, we used to just sell to neighbors, friends, uh, you know, and now we're we're definitely expanding and finding more need for that. People people want that. And it's kind of like you talked about, Ashley, you know, the, you know, whatever the greenhouse gases and the big feedlots and the big processing and just trying to go more local. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Daniel, I'd love to open it up for questions and for me or for Carrie, you know, ask us them too. Absolutely. If folks would just put their questions in the chat box. Um, I have a question for you, Ashley, while folks are doing that. Um, so uh, on the podcast, you start out each episode with a really thoughtful land acknowledgement. Um, and sometimes that land acknowledgement is read by a member of the tribe whose land the story comes from. And so it's quite powerful. Uh, but I'm curious if you can tell us um, what led you to record and include those land acknowledgements in that way. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, that I, I wrestled with that. Um, but because it felt it felt like it needed to be done. Um, and the question was how to do it. And so um, I actually hired a woman named Christine Trudeau. She's the um, indigenous desk editor for High Country News. And I had her um, edit several of the episodes just to make sure it's, it's called a cultural sensitivity edit and it's happening more and more in public radio just to kind of get someone from the community that you're presuming to cover as an outsider um, to get kind of a gut check and a reality check on the way you're telling the story. And I also asked her for advice on the land acknowledgement. And she said, well, why you, you need to reach out to every tribe and every nation that you're going to be, you know, acknowledging. And I said, oh, shoot. And this was like towards the end of production. It was a lot of work to get in touch and, and get those things to happen. But um, it was actually really powerful to be on the line with, with these elders, um, as many as, of whom as I could get. Um, to do the acknowledgements for the land um, where those episodes were recorded. And fully two of the episodes deal with center Native American voices, um, the Kelsey Ducheneau Scott episode, and then the other one about the land back movement is episode six, which you guys should check out. That was a really tough one to put together. And um, I think raised some really tough um, issues and questions around um, how white people came to own the West um, and who it was to, whom it was taken from. And so, yeah, land, ex land acknowledgement felt like something that just needed to be done, it's time. And um, yeah, thanks for noticing that, Daniel. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, okay, we got some questions coming into the chat box here. Uh, this question from Carrie um, asks, are there ways in the Valley to purchase local beef uh, or other meats um, in small kind of quantities besides buying half mm. a cow, lamb or pig? And Ashley, if you can answer that, great. I know there might be a couple other people in the audience who could also chime in on that one. Yeah, I, I completely um, would love some some help in answering that because I think you're right, Harry. It is really um, buying in bulk is, I mean, my husband and I got a chest freezer last year and, you know, now we do buy and freeze our beef. And, you know, I herded that cow for its whole life and then I, you know, eat it through the year um, as just taking it out of the freezer. So if that's something that's within your wheelhouse to do. Um, it's just a different way of shopping. It's a different rhythm of shopping, um, but it is kind of one option. Uh, and then I think that um, there are so many great producers in the Valley. The farmer's market on Saturday is a great way to be getting cuts um, and, and fresh produce. And um, the Meta Valley food shed is a new kind of um, outfit where you can be finding meat, especially. Uh, and then there's also um, Twistworks has Metow made, I believe, and they're kind of trying to connect producers with eaters more, I think. And I hope to see more of that in the future. Um, we're kind of wrestling with that at the Conservancy as well, in terms of how we better facilitate and create kind of a neutral ground where all the producers in the Valley can have their beef or, or produce um, available to people. So um, a lot of different things cooking, but um, I see Johnny, I don't know, Johnny, not to put you on the spot, but feel free to jump in if you want, if you have other tips to share with people or Daniel on the things that the Conservancy has done in the past or that are still available to folks. Yeah, I mean, one thing that folks can definitely do is go to our Met How Grown website and look at just the list of all the different um, meat producers that are here in the Valley. And then, you know, if there's one or two folks that really catch your interest, I encourage you to reach out and just talk to them directly about the best way that you can get their products. Um, and you'll probably learn some cool things in like by doing that and, and meet a new friend and maybe get a tour of their farm. So definitely don't be shy and use our Methow Grown website. Um, yeah, anybody else out there have anything to add? Yeah, John. Uh, Daniel, I can add just a little bit because, um, buying half or a whole animal is a really great way to stock your freezer and um 
have meat all year round, but also if you're just looking for smaller cuts, the Metow Valley Food Shed sells individual cuts of um, beef and lamb. And uh, that's, I can put the website um, in the chat. Basically you order online on between uh, Friday and Sunday, and then you can pick it up on Tuesdays or actually pick it up anytime with a self-serve pickup. Um, but if you check out mvfoodshed.com, that's a, where you can get more information. And Johnny, how many producers are providing um, meat and other uh, products on that? Um, so right now, BCS Livestock provides meat and at different times of the year, we've had other uh, meat producers, um, but we also sell veggies, milk, eggs, uh, sourdough bread products and a variety of other stuff seasonally, uh, but that's yeah. a year round online store. Yeah, so you can check them out on Instagram too, uh, MV Food Shed. Um, and I'm seeing Kayla, uh, we're over in the Okanagan Valley area and we sell shares of beef. Um, that's awesome to know. And so be sure folks write that down, bunch grass beef. Um, I know Deed and Carrie are selling shares as well. So um, a lot of it is kind of doing a little bit of legwork and doing your homework to kind of figure out um, starting with maybe the names that Daniel mentioned on the website and then contacting um, ranches directly to um, to start making those relationships. Because I what I love about this place is it is small enough that you can do that. You know, you can kind of reach out directly to the rancher and they're not necessarily the easiest people to get a hold of. Sometimes it does involve just kind of showing up and, you know, introducing yourself and kind of like I did with a horse, but maybe without one and just saying, I, I want to, you know, support what you're doing. And I think they're not used to hearing that. Um, so they might raise an eyebrow, but I think that, you know, if you're coming to it with an open heart, as I think people, what I love about this Valley is people are, and they want to see one another um, succeed and support one another. I think that that that's, uh, you know, not to sound too Pollyanna-ish about it, but I really believe in that. And I believe in that here. I think, I, I think that that is one thing that's really special um, about this place. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for everybody for chiming in on that one. Uh, Ashley, this question, asks what percentage of beef uh, production in the valley is in regenerative agriculture or is grass-fed? I do not have hard data on that, but I don't think it's a very high percentage. Um, and I think that that is something that can and is changing, frankly. Um, I think what you just heard from Carrie and Deed, you know, fewer of their cows are going to the feedlot system. They're going grass-finished and locally or near, slaughtered nearby and, and processed nearby, but at a small facility. That to me is um, regenerative. And I think that there are more practices that we can see ranchers in this valley start to adopt. And hopefully the conservancy can play a role in incentivizing, encouraging, and sharing knowledge about that. Um, BCS is certainly uh, one that I would point to as having a lot of um, regenerative practices already underway. Um, and I think communicates really well about what they're doing. I think a lot of maybe other ranchers are learning those skills and wanting to learn those skills more in the future as they start to embrace these practices. But I think if there's one thing I saw in producing this series is the transition is afoot and more and more ranchers are realizing that they need to tell their own stories and reach out to their customers directly um, and be more transparent about their practices, frankly. Um, just draw back the curtain and say, this is what it is. This is what ranching looks like. And it's hard and it's dirty and sometimes it's harsh. Um, and that's how we raise meat in this country. And there are better ways to do it. And more and more people, I think, adopting those ways, including here in the Valley. But yes, it is not a big percentage. I hope it grows in the future. Great. And Ashley, um, this question asks, uh, what surprised you the most working on this project? Hmm. Uh, you know, I think what was interesting to me is starting to understand um, the differences between urban and rural feminism. And I think that um, to a woman, I think the women in this series, if you called them or asked them if they considered themselves feminists, they would say no. And I think that that term, that's a bit of a dirty word in a lot of um, rural America, I think because it connotes uh, urban, liberal, um, you know, leather, <laughs> I don't know, biker, I have no idea what it means, uh, but I think that it, it means different things. It was an eye-opening for me to see how different differently that term is interpreted. I consider myself a feminist. I don't think it's a bad word. I think it's just about equality and, and elevating and sharing sharing the microphone, frankly, but um, it was very eye-opening. I'll never forget it. I was um, talking to a woman rancher that I was hoping to interview in Idaho 
and she said um, she's older, um, you know, conservative, I would say, um, from what I know about her. And she said, well, I disagree with the premise of your series. And I said, oh, really? Well, tell me more about that. And she said, well, I don't think that women, you know, women want to be separated out from their husbands and just speak exclusively about what they're doing or running, you know, they're not running ranches by themselves. So why would you just do a series about women? And I said, well, you know, this is, this isn't about, like, as I said, at the very beginning of this talk, like, the feminism I believe is, is not about putting men down or shutting them out or ignoring or not acknowledging the amazing things they bring to a family and to, to the work of ranching. It's just about sharing the microphone, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that was really eye opening to me. And, um, you know, I don't know, you know, however you approach feminism is, is your call. And it was just interesting. Uh, was that kind of a common response when you showed up to all these different communities and asked to specifically speak to women? Um, or were there other reactions where it was kind of like, well, it's about time. <laughs> I would say more the latter. I think honestly, yeah. there's, a, there's an iconic photograph um, of uh, a woman rancher. Gosh, I'm blanking on the, what is that photographer's name? I have her on my desk. Nope, I don't anymore. Um, anyway, it's a photograph of a woman in her chaps bent over a, a, a kitchen, you know, opening the oven to pull out lunch after a long day of moving cows, like working the ranch and just sort of doing everything. And I think that's sort of the, you know, we can have it all um, mm -hmm. feminism that I see in rural communities where it's just like, no, women just, we just get her done. You know, you just get her done. And so the ranches that I was showing up on, they knew I was coming to interview you know, I, I was very upfront, like it's a series about women ranchers. I want to interview you, you know, the woman, the matriarch of the family or the, the wife, the mother. Um, and so that was sort of not something I would spring on them, but it was really wonderful, you know, but I always interviewed their husbands as well. And so like you hear Glenn Elzinga, the father in the, in the episode about the Elzinga sisters, you hear Pete Lannon in the first episode. Um, again, it wasn't about excluding, it was just about sharing the microphone. Hmm. And people responded really well to that, I think overall. Yeah, it's great. A um, couple more questions here. Um, I know you kind of touched briefly on this, but if you could elaborate a little bit, you say you used to be a vegetarian, um, but how do you think about your personal meat consumption now? Um, I guess I would describe it as uh, it's a little more selective. Um, mm -hmm. I try, I try not to eat meat that I don't know is organic or I don't know where it came from. And that can be hard when you're on the road, but, and I, and I was on the road quite a bit for this series, but um, my husband and I buy a share of beef from Carrie Indeed. And um, we have a chest freezer now and we buy chickens from another friend who raises, raises them and have our own chickens for eggs. And so I think it's just trying to, um, it involves a little bit more planning and I guess premeditation. And of course the upfront cost of buying a share of beef is a little bit of like a gulp. That's a lot of money. But then when you do the math and you average out like the cost per pound and the kind of quality you're getting and the different cuts. And I don't mean to sound like an advertiser. It's like wherever you buy your beef, I'm not saying it's just eat and carry that you buy from. I'm just, it's a different way of thinking about the money that you spend on your food as um, now I think about it as voting with my dollars and just kind of saying like, this is the kind of ag I want to have happen. I know exactly how that cow spent its life because I chased it on my horse and it was a pretty darn happy cow. Um, that's sort of part of my personal ethos now, I would say. But, you know, again, I, I think that there is a role for all of us eating less meat. If you can't afford to buy, frankly, like BCS is expensive. Like those cuts are expensive at the Mazama store. And I'm the first to acknowledge that, you know, buying a share of beef is a lot of cash up front if you don't have 800 bucks to buy your beef for the year, you know, that can be, that's a tough, that's a tough nut to crack. And I don't have a solution to that, but I do think that um, when you actually do the math, if, if you can swallow that upfront cost, that the dollars, the cost per pound actually works out when you're buying in, in bulk um, mm -hmm. for, for us anyway, for my husband and I. Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. And are you, uh, you have time for one more question here? I'm hanging. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm curious what you hope for the next generation of ranchers. Mm. I mean, I see it already. I think that um, I look at Johnny and Casey and I see the next generation of ranchers here in the Valley and I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what they're doing. I'm excited that they're telling their story. Um, I saw it, you know, the women that I featured in the series, the Elzinga sisters, the oldest daughter, Melanie is 27, 28, you know, she's, She's going to probably be the one leading the next generation of ranchers running that ranch. And I see, um, I see an ability 
to speak for themselves mm -hmm. in a way that I think some of the big problems and the divisions, when we look at more people that are getting away from eating beef, I think it's frankly because we are all, myself included, when I lived in the city, especially so far removed from where our food comes from, that um, I think the next generation is not only adopting more sustainable regenerative practices, I think they're speaking out in a way that is empowering them to break free of the industrial meat system and really speak directly to customers, speak directly to, to eaters. Um, and I, I think that's new. I think that that, you know, like, like um, Corey Carmen was saying, it's a return in terms of the practices of her grandmother and the way her grandmother was ranching. Um, some of what we see, you know, Johnny and Casey doing and what Dean and Carrie are doing and, you know, are the oldest ways to, to do ranching. Um, but they've been sort of, um, I think, become harder and harder to do because it's not as cost effective when you're just going to sell that calf into the feedlot system and then never control the benefits of those sustainable practices because you're not selling the beef yourself because the feedlot doesn't care that that calf was raised organic until it went to the feedlot. That makes absolutely no difference to them that you're adaptive or rotationally grazing your land when the calf, once it's in that system, you don't reap a dollar for that extra effort. And so I think that this next generation is starting to, to wisen up and look at this, these monopolies, frankly, in the beef industry and say, it's not for us. We're going, we're making our own path. We're going direct and we're going to tell our own stories and we're not going to let someone else, you know, speak for us and frankly, villainize us anymore because that's what's happened, I think, in this country. Yeah, that's super interesting about <clears throat> kind of the next generation being more visible uh, as meat producers. And well, we were all raised on Facebook and social media too. So I think that's well, also I was, Yeah, I was <laughs> just thinking like, I, I think social media has, yeah, that's one of the good things that it, it, it can do is mm -hmm. like increase that visibility of those practices and of those small farms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know I said that was the last question, but here's actually the last question. Okay. Does Pistol get to go with you on all of your recording adventures? Does Pistol? Oh, I yeah. wish. Um, no, she didn't get to go on any of these because I think that there's also like, I'm very aware that even, uh, well, somebody reached out to me not too long, too long ago was like, hey, can I come meet ranchers and move cows with you on horseback? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how that works. You know, like that there is work to be done. If they don't know what kind of horse, you know, they don't know if you can ride. They don't, you know what I mean? So a lot of these yeah. ranchers, they didn't know me from Eve. I'm showing up on their property and I would make sure that they knew I, I move cows in the valley where I live. I know ranchers. Like that's why I'm making this series when I would talk to them on the phone, but showing up with my own horse. I mean, it was enough to just show up with my own saddle for a couple of the ranch visits where I could get out on horseback, but no pistol had to sit them out, unfortunately. But I did record the open and the final scene of the series um, with her because she's the best. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for speaking with us today and, and being uh, a force and um, a proponent for agriculture in the Valley. Uh, we just think it's a super um, important part of our community and we hope it thrives into the future. Uh, and thank you to Carrie indeed and uh, Johnny and all the other ag producers out there. And have a good night, everybody. Thank you.